Okay, here we are at our final lecture. So this week we're wrapping things up, looking at some of the major unaddressed aspects of the course. We're going to look at school policies, um, the processes of your own professional learning and professional development, um, the learning communities that you can become part of to continue that professional learning and development, the time allocations and the processes within schools for the delivery of the technologies learning area. So let's get started. First off, I'd like to have a look at a quick video from the Queensland Department of Education framing some of their policies as an introduction before we start exploring the various policies that are particularly related to technologies education. So, have a look at that video. Okay, so let's now look at some more specific policies that are going to impact upon your ability to teach, and in particular teach technologies education. So one of the first is the social media policy. A lot of teachers have been caught up in this over the years but essentially you need to ensure that anything that you share online is understood as your own personal view and doesn't represent your school's view or in particular the department of education or the or the queensland government's perspective um, this is particularly important for those in state schools and the policies i'm going to be showing you are specific to state schools for education queensland schools um, private schools generally have their own policy frameworks, some of them looser than the um, state system, a few of them a little bit stronger. Of course, um, private schools have got a lot of reputational value around perceptions of staff and, of course, of students and so forth. But in the 10, they don't, in general, they don't tend to be as bureaucratic as those involved in the state system. So a few other uh, specifics around social media. You shouldn't uh, imply, either intentionally or not, that you're authorised to speak on behalf of your school or of the department or of the government. And again, this can be challenging because you might be discussing some issues, say, with other teachers about approaches to teaching and learning. Um, so it's a complex space when you make comments um, in social media. So one of the big aspects is you must be sure that you never post things that could be seen as inappropriate or improper conduct. Now, traditionally, teachers have always been held to a higher standard in the community. Of course, you uh, represent role models for your students in your care. And if you go into a small town um, or even a small city like the Gold Coast, um, all of the teachers will generally be have their personal lives scrutinized by students, by parents, and by the community in general. So you do have to make sure that you are able to present yourself in a way that doesn't bring yourself into disrepute. Now, it's not as bad as it has been many years ago when female teachers couldn't get married and couldn't drink or even go to milk bars. These are all parts of the list of things that teachers weren't allowed to do. So it's nowhere near as constraining as that. But teachers do still need to work under greater constraints than many others in our society. So in general, you shouldn't disclose on social media any confidential or personal information, particularly any information that you've gained as a result of your employment, um, be it related to other teachers, such as their um, home addresses or phone numbers, um, but also in particular about your students. And this includes any photographs. Um, photography has been an interesting issue and in Queensland and in Australia in general, we've taken a very hard stance on the sharing of photographs of students and of other employees and so forth. It's nowhere near as strict in other countries, but it's the culture that has arisen in Australia. 
And so generally you need to have written consent to be able to display images. Uh, it's just the nature of our society. You need to make sure that any commentary you make on social media um, about public issues doesn't have an impact upon your ability to teach in an unbiased and independent way. Now, this can also include political views, certainly a lot of social views, religious views, um, and social media in this context can be can extended to other forms of online communication. It may be in a gaming platform where you're having discussions about things with other gamers. Um, there can be a whole range of different spaces where these issues could be made public or um, bring your particular perspectives into question in how you may be imparting these views to your students. Again, a complex issue, lots of um, potential uh, stories and issues around this as it has occurred. And certainly the unions and the um, teacher registration bodies can support teachers in some instances, but also can help crack down on teachers in other instances. Um, there's a lot of issues that are, um, that are sort of trigger points at the moment, at, the moment, or at any time. Um, so you just need to be careful around how you present yourself and what you discuss in an online way. And this includes any communications made outside of the scope of your role. So you're not in your own official capacity. So it doesn't need to be just things about teaching that you're discussing. It could be anything that you're discussing. And it can be what's being discussed on your personal devices and your personal social media platforms and anything that's happening outside of work hours. So it's a very much a catch-all. Now, there are still some limitations. Um, private phone conversations generally can't be tapped. And, um, but in the main, teachers are held to very high standards because you represent role models for your students and society and the community expects you to be above reproach to a reasonable degree. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem reasonable, but um, generally it's not overly done. Okay, so that's social media. Now you're also going to have limitations on how you can use various technologies provided to you by your employers, um, or not provided in this case. Uh, generally, Education Queensland will restrict you in your use of other email systems for any work-related communications. So you have to use their email system. And one thing they're very strong on is you can't then use that email system to email anything about students to another email system that you might also use. So again, anything to do with students you don't want to have go outside of the control of the departmental environment. Uh, another issue that they're cracking down on is wastage in terms of teacher printing. Now, it's always been an issue around teachers having access to stationery and other resources, and it's always been limited. Uh, teachers love stationery, and having access to the stationery cupboard is nirvana for many, particularly primary school teachers. Um, so unfortunately, many schools limit teachers' access, including access to photocopying and printing, um, where it's generally required to be minimized, um, done in black and white, double-sided, and using draft quality, so it minimizes the amount of toner used. And if you're lucky enough to have a color printer or color photocopier in the school, essentially it's only to be used by the principal for doing the annual reports or publications for parents. Now, it's a little bit uh, facetious. Certainly in many private schools, you do have access to color printing and so forth. And in some state schools, that's the case. But you would certainly be expected to be reasonable in your use of those resources. Um, of course, it, they can be expensive. 
uh, can be quite expensive, particularly if you're doing whole class sets and booklets and so forth. So there are relatively reasonable um, requirements around that, and in some cases, relatively unreasonable requirements around not using resources. Now, this is an interesting one around intellectual property and copyright. Now, essentially, anything that you create, any worksheet, a booklet, diagram that you create in the course of your employment, so related to teaching and learning, is owned by your employer, by your school or by the Department of Education, in the case of state schools, and so forth. Even if it's done outside of work hours, done on your holidays, done at night, it still belongs to the employer, which means you can't then sell it and in some cases share it. Um, so it does have to be things related somewhat to teaching and learning. But as a teacher, almost everything you do will be related to teaching and learning. So it's a bit of a big catch-all. But if you've got another hobby, say origami, and you don't teach origami, and you do some origami stuff and come up with a new origami pattern, you can publish that and make money off that. But um, it's very restrictive on what you can do around teaching materials. Now, that said, it's not often enforced. Um, and there are some ways around it. Um, but in general, you need to get your principal's permission if you want to create resources, say, for a book that you wanted to publish, or even a booklet. Or there are some websites where teachers share resources and sell resources to other teachers. Um, I'd probably stay away from that unless you get explicit permission from your principal. Um, of course, that's publicly searchable. It'd be reasonably easy for that to be identified and for a case to be made against you that you are property at the expense of your employer um, through the work that you're creating as part of your employment. Um, now, there's an interesting perspective on this that's changed, though, is that there's now an expectation within the state school system that anything that you create, or indeed anything that you buy or um, gather should be able to be shared under what's called a Creative Commons attribution, which basically means it can be shared with anyone as long as they uh, acknowledge where it was sourced from. Um, so that's an interesting new direction where the department's going, which does somewhat contravene some of their other perspectives. Um, of course, this actually can encourage you to share your resources. Still can't make profit off them, but you can share them. Um, and it's also a Creative Commons attribution that's non-commercial. Um, there's not a non-commercial thing in there. So other people can actually make money off what you create, but you can't make money off it. So some interesting um, little dissonances being created by different policy perspectives. OK, so next is around information privacy. So you're going to collect information. Um, it may be students' names. It may be test results. Um, there will be many instances where you're going to, have to collect information, particularly about students. And as long as it's required as part of your duties in order to be a teacher, it's generally OK, within some caveats. Um, in the state school system, you can't make up your own forms to collect this information. You have to use government departmental approved forms. Again, I've never seen that really enforced in primary schools, but technically you can't make up your own survey forms and interview forms and questionnaires and other forms to collect the information. It has to be on departmental approved forms. Um, and you should include a privacy notice when you're collecting this information. Again, it gets difficult for young students, but particularly if you're collecting information, um, relatively detailed information, you need to get uh, let the parents know that you're collecting this information and allow them an option to opt out. Um, OK, so once you've collected the information, now you have to classify it. And there are information security classifications that you need to apply for any personal information that you collect, even if it's students' names and attendance data or going on excursion details and any personal information that's collected has to be assessed against 
three levels. Is it official, which is non-sensitive routine material? Is it potentially sensitive material, confidential information that needs to be restricted on a need to know basis? Or is it protected information that's highly significant? Um, let's say passwords, um, tax file numbers, uh, things that Optus shares quite readily. Um, so you need to identify what your information is that you're collecting and what level of security um, it needs to be classified as, because that will then relate to how it's then stored and when it has to be destroyed and a whole range of other processes that you can investigate once you're employed. Um, but you have to make sure it uh, protects both the paper formats, any digital formats, including photographs, but also any, any devices that it may be stored on in terms of mobile devices, including mobile phones or laptops or digital cameras, anything where the data could be um, lost and others could get access to it. A big thing is you are responsible for reporting in a timely manner anything, any personal information that is lost. So if you've got some information on your laptop and you lose your laptop, you have to report it to your principal as soon as possible. That then goes to a number of instances where they can then mitigate those losses. But if you don't report it, that's then a significant breach that you've made, um, even if it was a completely accidental or a theft or whatever else, it was sitting in the back of your car and it was stolen, you've got to report it. And it can be just a thing such as a USB stick. Um, again, reiterating that you should never email student personal information outside of the departmental network. So to um, say a colleague in a non-government school, um, I guess potentially emailing anything to the Queensland Studies Authority, although I'm pretty sure that does happen. Um, but, so there are, there, again, that's a really strict one that they're very careful around email communications. Just because it's so easy to accidentally distribute confidential information by email attachments or even just in the text of an email. Okay, now comes a really difficult one. This is the use of non-departmental ICT services. Essentially, any online website or application that the, the department hasn't explicitly approved. And they have a, a white list of um, websites and services that you can use without seeking um, additional approval. And anything not on that list, you have to go through a whole process of requesting access to use, use that. And there's a range of things that will automatically disqualify it. So first off, you have to determine that's information security classification. How sensitive is the information going to be that is stored on that um, service? And then there's one that cancels all that because you won't be able to worry about any level of security classification if any personal information is stored or transmitted offshore, which means the service is run from another country. So if it's not an Australian service where the information is stored on an Australian server, then automatically you can't use that service. And this includes students' names. So if the students have to fill in their names in order to be able to use the website, that's not allowed, uh, which pretty much knocks out 95% of all online web services. Private schools, no problems. They have nowhere near this level of restriction. It does come down to an obscure legal requirement set in place in the 18th century where um, student data couldn't be sent interstate it had to be stored within Queensland um, but that rule has been now applied to the online space um, as a way of restricting the use of a whole range of sites including all the Google services and and so forth now there are ways of getting approval um, it's complex and involved, but teachers can request access. You have to show that there's not an equivalent approved service that can um, meet the needs. And you need to show that there are ways of mitigating student potential data loss. Um, but there are ways to still use some of these services. It's just they make it fairly difficult.
Okay, so even once you're using these, you still need to go through a risk assessment to get access to the um, services, which details the information, classifications, and the types of information that's going to be stored and so forth. And then your principal can seek approval. You can't actually seek approval yourself, but your principal can actually seek approval sometimes just from um, the students or the parents. Um, Sometimes it has to go higher depending upon the security classification and there's a whole range of different processes and flowcharts, um, many of which you have to be an Education Queensland employee to be able to access and learn about. So we'll just give an overview here. Now, another thing is when you're using, say, the internet, um, let's say you're searching for an image in Google and the students accidentally come across an inappropriate image. One of my first instances of using the internet, way back in about 1995 or so, um, the internet at that stage involved a few thousand websites. Um, I had a list of all the websites on the Gold Coast, uh, all 20 or so of them. Um, but we were doing some searches with some primary school kids and the movie The Babe had just come out. And so many of the students wanted to find some images related to the movie which was a mistake. Um, so there will be accidents. Now, the Australian government and schools, including departmental schools, have strong filtering systems in place to try to avoid accidental exposure to inappropriate material. But as everyone knows, there's a lot of inappropriate material on the internet and those um, services won't catch everything. So if students accidentally um, access inappropriate material. It needs to be reported to you by the, by the students and you need to report it to the principal. Now I know it can seem quite trivial, but these things do need to be reported. Of course, if the students go home and tell their parents and the parents then tell the PNC and the PNC, someone on the PNC tells the minister and the minister then contacts the principal, then you're in a bit of trouble. And it happens more often than you would think. So you've got to report things. Um, and then actions can be taken or assessments can be made as to whether the actions need to be taken. A few other things you need, if you're using departmental email, you have to use the departmental e-block signatures. It's sort of a uniformity associated with that. Um, and you will also be responsible to ensuring backups. Now, even though a lot of the systems have automated backup processes in place, you are still responsible for the information that you're working on, and particularly if it's on mobile devices, um, for having a backup process. And just losing the information and saying it was lost, something went wrong technically, is not acceptable. You have to actually have some backup process in place, and you will be held responsible for ensuring that. Of course, potentially you could lose some quite significant data, say student assessment or student assignments. It happens all the time in secondary schools, but these things can be really significant. So you do need to make sure that you're responsible in your handling of data. Okay, and just reiterating on the definition of personal mobile devices, it's not just your mobile phone. It includes PDAs and tablets and notebooks and um, ebook readers, gaming devices, voice recorders, cameras, USB drives, flash drives, hard disks, um, smart watches, whole range of things are considered personal mobile devices. Anything that can um, retain data and provide the mobility of data um, does come under these policies. And there's various processes you need to go through. And various schools will have different policies around the use of personal devices. Um, generally, they've been relaxed for teachers. There was a time when teachers couldn't have mobile phones and a whole range of other things. That's generally acceptable now. Um, but many schools do still have quite stringent restrictions on how students can have access to and utilize personal devices. And indeed, some restrictions are often still in place around how teachers can use those devices when they're teaching. Um, okay. The last major aspect is around risk assessments. Now, generally, any activity you do with students will be subject to a risk assessment. Some of them are very informal, just as part of your lesson planning. Some of them need to be done more significantly, um, such as some design technology activities and digital technologies activities. 
um, the use of hot glue guns, for example, you would need to do a risk assessment. Um, anything to do with food production, you would need to do a risk assessment. And they're normally quite um, simple, and there's lots of existing templates, and indeed many schools will already have a full library of risk assessments that you can just say that these are the ones you're addressing. Um, but essentially you need to try to foresee any reasonable risks, such as students tripping and falling and being impaled by various objects and so forth. Of course, they need to be reasonable. Um, being hit by asteroids and so forth, unreasonable. But anything that is within your control to mitigate um, are things that you should consider as part of your risk assessment. And it also incorporates a record keeping process so that as accidents occur, they can be recorded and they can be incorporated into future risk assessments so that they improve and become the activities become less risky. Now, there should always be some sort of induction process for um, an emergency procedures for your students as to what to do when various things happen. Um, of course, we've got our fire alarms and so forth. But what happens if there, if a hot glue gun catches fire? Um, what happens within the classroom? What happens if someone drops something and there's some glass on the ground? What are the students to do? So there's a whole range of little activities that you could then go through with your students, teaching them about risks, but also going through your own risk assessments and being able to mitigate what might occur. Of course, having these procedures in place for if things happen can be part of your mitigation of potential risks. Now, particularly any adults involved in the room, such as um, uh, parents or, or um, teacher assistants and parents assistants, they need to be aware of any risk assessments that have been done and the procedures to happen that to occur in those events. And an additional one is you need to confirm the blue card qualifications of any adults um, that are being in, involved in any of the activities you're responsible for, just for um, other risks associated with um, classroom environments. Okay, so essentially though, you are the overall responsibility. You have the overall responsibility. You have what's called duty of care. And in your other courses, you'll go through and learn more about duty of care. Um, but essentially around risk assessment, you need to ensure that within reasonable precautions, you've made the activities as safe as possible. Um, and you should review those regularly and improve them as you learn more about the activities and the tools and the equipment and any instances that might occur. And these are some of the existing templates um, that um, are available within Education Queensland, but anyone can get access to them. So you can use them from other schools as well um, around workshop activities. So any of the practical activities involving um, hammers and drills and hot glue guns and things of that nature. Um, fabric and fiber activities have got their own special risk assessment, food production, and also food experimentation such as when you experimented with different ingredients um, in your ice cream would be an experimentation process. So there are things there. So, you don't, so the experimentation doesn't go too extreme and incorporate things that you shouldn't be experimenting with in um, food production. Gardening and hand tool use um, in student gardens and school gardens and also remotely piloted drones have their own special category as well. Um, a lot of the online safety stuff doesn't yet have risk assessments. Um, so that will probably come in the next few years. But at the moment, that's not normally incorporated into risk assessment, which is more focused on physical risks. But there are a whole range of other aspects which you're going to be teaching about in terms of cyber safety and cyberbullying and a whole range of other potential um, things that can occur in the digital space that you should also consider. If you've got students, say, playing an online game, and they're communicating with each other in the chat system, have you considered online bullying within that chat environment or the use of swearing or the sharing of inappropriate material? There can be a whole range of different risks associated with digital technologies that haven't quite become an expectation for teachers to manage in risk assessments yet, but I suspect that will occur definitely within the next couple of years. Okay, 
So let's take a little break and have a look at the next, as an introduction to the next aspect we're going to look at around professional learning, an example from Taruna Primary School on coaching and mentoring. Okay, so let's look at some ways that you can maintain your own professional learning and what we call professional development. Um, it's a continuing professional development requirement of your teacher registration that you annually meet a range of aspects of professional learning. So there will be school directed professional learning, there will be teacher identified professional learning or continuing professional development, as I should say. And you need to ensure that you cover a range of continuing professional development activities. So you can't just do all the same activity. Now, as a minimum requirement of 20 hours per year that have to be documented with some form of certificates or some sort of evidence that you will upload to the uh, Queensland College of, Edu of Teachers um, uh, digital environment to show evidence that you've maintained your continuing professional development requirement. And if you don't, you could have your registration lapse. So it's important that you plan out how you're going to maintain your ongoing learning. And the Queensland College of Teachers does random audits where they will then ask to see a lot more evidence of how you've done your professional learning Generally, though, 20 hours is, if you're a teacher in, a, in any sort of teaching environment, it's almost impossible not to achieve 20 hours. Now, you may forget to collect the evidence of it, but it's, it's not a particularly onerous requirement. Um, schools will have a range of professional learning activities that they offer each year, um, but you can't just rely upon that. You have to have a balance across all three. So you will have to go and seek your own professional learning opportunities as well. And you'll have to make sure that there's a range of different types of activities. Okay, so some of the activities that count, um, being involved in various initiatives, such as pilots, trials and projects, attending workshops, seminars, conferences, courses and online learning activities, um, school professional development days, being involved in syllabus, curriculum and assessment professional learning, um, being involved in national and state test marking and judgments around um, testing and teacher consistency, um, creating and delivering formal presentations to colleagues on things that you've learnt through other means and sharing that with your colleagues can be considered your own professional learning as well. Uh, leading school-based curriculum and policy developments. So if you're coming up with a whole new, say, section on, let's say, the general capabilities for digital literacy around cyber safety to teach all the teachers in the school about um, some of the new changes happening in that space, that could count towards your professional development. Uh, supervising and mentoring pre-service and beginning teachers can count. Obviously, that won't count for yourself initially, that your supervising teachers, it can count. And eventually you'll take on your own supervising and mentoring roles and you'll be able to count that. And being involved in research projects done by universities and conducting your own action research projects can also count towards your professional development. Being involved in overseas teacher exchanges can count um, and also professional reading. This one's sometimes exploited. It's got to be reasonably substantial professional reading. But in learning about new pedagogy or a new subject, um, exploring that, researching into that, getting involved in it and finding out a lot about it, um, and ideally also then sharing that with your colleagues through presentations and workshops can count. And also undertaking further studies, more formal studies, such as a master's degree or a PhD or an, ed or an EDD doctorate. Probably not something you're thinking about immediately, but it's certainly another area where you can extend your own professional learning. Of course, this is all about continuing your own learning. 
Um, another initiative that they've just started at the Queensland College of Teachers is digital portfolios to provide evidence of these activities where you can upload um, photographs and photographs of certificates and so forth, just to make it a little bit easier for the record keeping processes. Okay, now there'll also be support within your larger sectors. So within Education Queensland, there is the QLearn online environment, which has replaced the learning place. Um, and it um, they run a range of professional learning activities, generally after school or um, sometimes during in school online, where you can learn about new initiatives and ideas and approaches and so forth. Independent School Queensland does the same for the independent school sector. Uh, the Catholic school sector has similar ones. Um, the Catholic school sector has an overarching body, the Queensland Catholic Education Commission. Um, but in the main, the dioceses have their own organisations which run their own professional learning around particular initiatives that they're focused on. Um, and then there's also the Lutheran School Network, which has their own professional learning activities as well. So whatever school you're involved in, there'll be a range of different support mechanisms provided to teachers and to principals and other school leaders around their supporting their professional learning. The unions also run professional learning, not just around industrial issues, but also to support new initiatives. Um, they've been doing a lot of professional learning around digital technologies and upskilling teachers in being able to engage with technology, but also lots of other skills around leadership and ethics and um, anything new um, that involves a, um, a whole lot of complexities. Uh, the unions will often develop courses to support teachers as part of their services. Now, beyond schools, industry, particularly the IT industry, has been quite active in supporting teacher professional learning. Um, each of the major tech companies have um, quite extensive professional learning opportunities. Um, and there are these websites that are portals to a whole range of programs and resources that you can get access to from Google, Apple, Adobe, and Microsoft. And they also have a system of recognizing um, teachers that are particularly focusing on becoming experts around various uses of technology in schools, digital technologies. Uh, Google has a um, quite a complex certification system now leading up to Google certified innovators. Adobe has their creative educator framework. Apple has the distinguished educator framework and a number of other frameworks um, leading up to that now. And Microsoft has their innovative educator expert um, framework. Now these provide um, accreditation um, systems whereby you can then use, like, use these in your um, CVs, going for jobs, but also um, they provide networks and networking opportunities for like-minded teachers to come to together and to be supported by these companies around various activities, but also just to share their ideas amongst one another and to learn essentially from best practice. So if you want to be an exceptional teacher um, around digital technologies in particular, you would want to get involved in these networks and um, they can really support your career progression, which then improves what you do with your students. Beyond that though, there are a whole range of other learning communities that you can engage with. There's first your own school community, um, your other teachers, your peers, um, the school leadership, there's a lot of learning that can be done amongst your other community members. And for aspects of design and technology, the school, um, the janitors and the cleaners, they get involved in a lot of activities such as gardening and um, other sort of processes that can be very useful within um, design and technology. The canteen and tuck shop um, staff can be very useful when teaching about food and food production. So look at the resources, human resources you have within your schools as to how you can extend your own learning about what you can do with your students. 
And don't forget about your parents. They've got a huge wealth of knowledge about a whole range of things, not just what they're doing as a job, but also a whole range of other skills they might have in their hobbies and interests that they can bring into your classroom and into your own professional learning. Um, and they're more than willing to help, uh, particularly when it relates to their own child. But if you can identify a, uh, a parent from a year seven class, even though you might be teaching year three, that has particular expertise around something, get them to share that expertise with you and to upskill yourself or come in and co-teach with you and get involved in utilizing that expertise in what you're teaching with your students. There's also a lot of sharing between schools. Um, not everyone's an expert in everything. So I, we form clusters and networks where teachers get together and share what they're doing in terms of their best practices and their ideas and their assessment techniques and new, new pedagogies, and everyone learns from each other. And beyond that, there's a more formal structure of what's called professional associations, where teachers form associations, which have generally you subscribe to and have membership of, sometimes there's a, a membership fee, and they put on conferences and workshops and activities that then support your career progression, your ongoing learning about what you need to learn about in what you're teaching. And there's what there's professional associations for a whole range of them. I'm going to sh share with you a few of those in a second. And then beyond that, there's other online communities and we'll have a look at those. So some of the main professional associations for digital technologies in Queensland, there's QSITE, the Queensland Society for Information Technology and Education, which is teachers, coming together at conferences and workshops, and they have chapters around the state, so to support workshops in uh, regional areas. Um, but if you're thinking about really specializing in digital technologies, that's a great community to become involved in. Now, Design and Technology has their own called DATA, um, Design and Technology Teachers Association of Queensland, which focuses on um, design and technology activities and professional learning and so forth. There's also a particular association for beginning teachers, what's called beginning and establishing teachers, to assist teachers in networking with one another in the first few years of becoming a teacher, when it's actually the most challenging. And then above it all, there's the Australian College of Educators, which looks after all teachers regardless of the level um, and supports teachers through some high level uh, professional learning and mentoring programs and just being involved in that as um, a general career progression as a teacher. Now there are also associations for teacher leaders and all the different other subjects, um, but they're the main ones associated with um, technologies education. So beyond that, though, there's also a whole range of online communities that you can be involved with. In particular on Facebook, there's a whole range of them. These are just some of the ones related to design and technology and digital technologies that you can join up generally for free. They don't tend to put on a lot of professional learning activities, but they're a fantastic resource to share ideas and ask questions and see the ongoing conversations about various issues that are impacting um, the teaching of digital technologies and designer technologies. Okay, let's take another break and I want you to have a look at the Young ICT Explorers competition. This is a little video that um, details this annual competition um, that's been going for about 10 years now where it's, essentially it's like a science fair, but focusing on design technology and digital technologies. So have a look at that and then we'll come back. Okay, so hopefully in the background of the video, you would have seen a whole range of different projects and activities that students uh, work on as part of this competition and they get to then be judged by industry professionals and academics. I've been a judge of these for the last 10 years or so. And the students get to showcase 
the projects that they've been working on. But more importantly, they get to go around and look at all the hundreds of other projects and ideas and uh, ways that students have approached doing technologies um, solutions to various problems. And it's also a fantastic way for teachers to go along and see all the different ways that other schools are approaching doing activities in technologies education. Now, there are a number of other um, resources that are useful for you. This is the Digital Technologies in Focus project uh, that particularly went and looked at how digital technologies is being implemented in a range of different schools, particularly remote and disadvantaged schools. Um, and they built these school stories about how different schools have approached um, implementing digital technologies. But they also developed a, a good set of resources and also a set of webinars explaining various concepts such as computational thinking and design thinking and, and so forth. So another good resource for you to utilize in technologies education. Teach Engineering is a great resource for lots and lots of ideas around design and technology. And you can search for in, um, thousands and thousands of different activity ideas. And of course, there's the Digital Technologies Hub that you've already utilized, but it's a great similar source of ideas and activities for digital technologies. For Queensland State Schools, there's a particular set of curriculum that's been developed for state school teachers. Unfortunately, they jealously guard this material. Um, you can get access to it through some Catholic schools where they've paid to have Catholic school teachers have access to it. But in the main, they've kept it quite restricted. Um, not necessarily a bad thing. The resource is starting to date quite rapidly. And certainly it, it's not up to date with the new version of the curriculum. But a lot of state schools have used it as a framework for teachers to teach various subjects of the digital tech of the digital oh, sorry of the Australian curriculum. Um, now it was set in place to assist teachers if they couldn't develop their own resources and approaches to teaching the Australian curriculum. Um, and it was meant to be a base level resource that any teacher could utilize, no matter their level of capability. So it was never intended to be what everyone had to teach. Unfortunately, a few principals didn't see it that way. And one particular um, minister. But the idea is that you should use it as a resource for ideas, but don't necessarily be constrained by having to do only what is in the C2C materials. That said, there are a few schools where they're required to teach the C2C materials. So you'll need to negotiate that with your principal when you get there. But it is a good set of resources when you're first starting out as a base level um, set of activities and lessons and so forth with lots of resource material to go with it that you can fall back on um, if you've got nothing else to work with. But hopefully having completed this course, you're well and truly able to go well beyond the expectations of the C2C material. Another resource, whoops, that has just become available for free. I don't tend to share with you resources that involve costs and the Grok Academy up until quite recently um, did have to charge a fee to utilize, but through some philanth philanthropic grants, it's now been made available for free for all teachers to use. And it includes a lot of very high level um, activities and particularly activities that provide a lot of feedback to the students on how they're progressing through the activity. So as they do the activity, say learning how to use micro bits or a cryptographic activity, or there's many, several dozen activities that students can use in all areas of the, particularly digital technologies curriculum. It has a very um, robust system for providing feedback on how students are progressing and identifying where they're making mistakes and correcting those mistakes and guiding them with additional material back towards 
achieving success. So I encourage you to have a look at the Rock Academy resources and also use them. There's some good resources there for your own professional learning as well. Okay, before we get to our final section, just want you to have a look at how one school, one pri primary school, has engaged with the, in particular, digital technologies curriculum and how they're going with the teaching of the subject. So have a look at that. Okay. Oops. So now let's get into the final aspects of implementation of the technologies learning area in schools. Now, much of this will be decided by your principal and by the leadership team or by the whole of school um, coming together to decide upon priority areas and where things will be allocated. But in general, digital technologies in F2 should um, have at least um, or almost 3% of the curriculum time. Now, there's still about 25% of discretionary time that can be allocated to any subject. So if, say, technologies were seen as a priority area, then some of that um, block of discretionary time could be allocated to double or triple or quadruple the amount of expected minimum time that um, is used for the teaching of te um, technologies education. And that includes both design technology and digital technologies. Um, I think I missed a slide. Oh. Just make the slide. Ah, here it is. Um, so this breaks down the hours by learning area. So we see that in F2, we generally have 20 hours per year. So it doesn't sound like much, but it's about the same that's being spent on the teaching of history or on teaching of geography. But it's about half as much time is spent on teaching of um, science or the arts. So there are priorities and technologies um, sits in that space. But in years three to four, it doubles and is expected to have 40 hours per year. So it's generally one hour a week. So half an hour a week in F to two, one hour a week in three to four, at the minimum. Fortunately, there's some schools that go even below the minimum, but we won't talk too much about that. Um, but there's that expectation. Now, some schools, though, will decide to have, instead of one hour a week over the entire year, they will have two hours a week for half the year. So there are ways of adjusting that. But overall, there should be 40 hours um, addressed to cover the expectations of the technologies learning area, both digital technologies and design and technology. So 20 hours each if they were each receiving the same allocation. And then that extends up to 60 hours in years five to six. So again, almost as much as is spent on science, um, more than what's spent on history or geography, a uh, little bit less than the um, is spent on the arts. So it's raising in importance as it goes up in the years. But remember, that's for the two subjects. So it's 30 hours for design and technology, 30 hours for digital technologies. So just in a graphical format, here we see in years three to four, it's gone from almost three to 3% 3 to over 5% at the bare minimum. And then in years five to six, we're approaching 8% of the curriculum time. Uh, while science is approaching 9%, mathematics 20%, English 25%, and the various other learning areas. So that sort of sits within the importance of the subjects. Now, I'd love to say that that was universally being applied throughout all the schools. Um, eventually it will be, but principals do have decisions as to where they focus on learning areas. Um, and they certainly have their discretionary time that they have to allocate out. 
So oh, I'm doing a bit there. Okay, so within your schools, there'll be discussions as to how they're going to cover the curriculum areas. And these will relate to the goals, vision, and priorities of the school. Now, MAPLAN tends to have a priority favoring numeracy and literacy development. Um, there's a process that schools go through around implementing the curriculum and coming up with the decision making. Again, you'll hopefully have some feedback into that, but in your first few years as teachers, you'll be observing this process. But when creating the plan, your school will decide upon what's appropriate. Um, and then it comes down to how it's actually going to address the teaching of these subjects, particularly these smaller subjects like design technology and digital technologies and the, the art sometimes um, and so forth. It can either be taught explicitly as its own subject or it can be taught implicitly integrated into other subject areas. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. So the explicit or specialist role or the integrated modes. Now in Queensland, because digital technologies in particular was seen as going to be a bit of a challenge for teachers who hadn't necessarily embraced um, their own use of digital technologies particularly strongly, and certainly hadn't embraced teaching digital technologies strongly, that it was appropriate to provide schools with funding to employ specialist um, digital technologies teachers. And that was done over a number of years. That funding though, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't been renewed. And so schools are now in the position of either having to continue that funding from their own resources to um, maintain those specialist roles or to focus on an integrated mode, um, incorporating the expectation of all teachers to teach digital technologies and design technologies and, and all the subjects. Okay, so where there is that explicit specialist role though, the subject is taught by a specialist teacher. Um, and generally in primary schools, other teachers are given either non-contact time where they can do lesson preparation and so forth, or what was intended in terms of the funding, they observe and learn from the specialist teacher and build their own capacity to be able to teach digital technologies when that funding runs out. Um, unfortunately, at the same time, there was quite a bit of discussion about the crowded curriculum and the lack of non-contact time primary teachers had to work on lesson preparation. And so principals um, explored possibilities to provide more non-contact time and where there were specialist teachers available, that observation and learning role tended to be overridden by the requirement to provide teachers with more non-contact time. A great goal in itself, but it did subvert much of the intent of providing those specialist teachers to upskill all teachers in their capacity to teach digital technologies. Okay, oops, just going a bit slow there. So one um, outcome of the specialist teacher role though, is it does highlight the importance of teaching technologies within the school. All the teachers can see that, okay, this subject's important enough that the school is actually employing a specialist to teach, um, teach the subject. So that is a good outcome. Uh, but it does mean that most of the teachers can be disengaged from the teaching of the subject, which is not the ideal or the overall intent of the Australian curriculum was to have all teachers in primary teaching all of the learning areas. That was how the curriculum was designed, rather than having to rely, as we do in secondary schools, with specialist teachers teaching the subjects. So a big aspect of the integrated mode where you teach all subjects is you can then make connections between what you're learning between the different learning areas. So when you teach something, say on the airdrop, you can teach it from a design and technology perspective, 
around the engineering aspects of keeping the egg safe, that you can also teach it from a forces perspective from science about having a parachute or having the forces be reduced by friction and a whole range of other elements that can be incorporated there. You can then incorporate some aspects of mathematics, working out the height of the, um, the egg drop and potentially the forces involved and how, how much force is going to be applied when it hits the ground. So there's a range of other elements that can be incorporated in there. You can even look at um, geography and history, looking at the Tower of Pisa, how they used to drop cannonballs from that to learn about those scientific um, principles. So lots of opportunities to explore different um, elements of the curriculum. Students can write stories about the egg and about the how it feels about going through this egg drop perspective um, activity and incorporated into the the um, fairy tale of Humpty Dumpty. And so there's lots of other elements that can be incorporated into using that activity to address a whole range of learning areas. That's the strength of the integrated approach. It can also reduce time pressure. Of course, as we saw with those time allocations, if you can do one project that addresses five or six learning areas, then that can be incorporated and utilize um, a sliver of all those learning areas time allocation. So you can do much more complex and involved activities that can involve a lot, a lot more time by integrating more learning areas into the activity. However, assessment can be more challenging. Of course, you now have to assess all of those learning areas. It's not particularly more difficult, but it's just more complex. So you have to make sure that students are learning all of those different elements that are going to be required to be learnt from all the learning areas and that you're collecting evidence about that learning from all those areas. Now, one planning process proven quite successful for this is called hexagonal, hexagonal mapping. Of course, when we just plan with tables, you don't necessarily see all the interconnections. Yes, we could make a systems model. That would be a great way of doing it. But another approach is to look at hexagonal uh, mapping. This allows you to um, connect lots of different elements together uh, in a way that helps it make sense. So you start out with a whole lot of hexagons and you write your curriculum activities and your learning outcomes, the content descriptors and the assessment outcomes and all the rest. And you then start putting them in relation to one another. And you build these um, interrelationship maps of how all of these curriculum elements can work together in an integrated way. And there's various processes that can be done through and you can get quite complex and involved mapping activities. And you, by ensuring then that all of the learning outcomes are addressed and all of the accessible elements are addressed through assessment and how they all relate to the activities that are being um, explored. So this is looking at Australian wearables. So they're making costumes um, set in an Australian context, but they're also looking at um, Asia and um, Asian elements influencing that and a whole range of other learning areas and cross curriculum activities and general capabilities can all be mapped out using this more hexagonal approach rather than just creating lists and, and things of that nature. So just a few other elements there where they're going through the process. Okay. So the other key aspect of it, of the integrated mode is it's much easier to incorporate school priorities, um, say the thinking skills, um, but also things such as the general capabilities, the critical and creative thinking, the numeracy and literacy development, STEM and STEAM inquiries, any initiative that the school is undertaking can be incorporated much more easily in an integrated way than if it's all siloed into subjects. There are tools and templates that can be used to assist in this process, and there are various ones available for the different year levels. And the QCAA has a whole lot of resources for developing unit planning. Now, unit planning, we haven't touched on a lot. Um, we've alluded to it. Of course, most of our, um, most of the learning occurring in the technologies area 
is in units where they do projects. Now you would have faced the same challenge in addressing your lesson planning. Of course, you're doing a lesson that will be within a unit, which is a series of lessons that address a whole range of learning outcomes collectively. And there are particular ways of developing units and unit planning, but it involves a fair amount of experience with lesson planning before you can really start doing unit planning effectively. So in this course, we focus on lesson planning, um, but unit planning you'll come to as you gain experience as a teacher, but it's in primary schools, it's generally always done collaboratively. And particularly if you're doing it cross-curricular, of course you have to work with uh, other teachers, but you have to, have to also work with teachers at different um, year levels and how they all interrelate and can collaboratively work towards achieving effective units. Okay, so as we come to the end, in your tutorials this week, what I want you to do is to look at online privacy. And in particular, I would like you to look at your own digital footprint. Do a quick search and see what you can find about yourself and view it from the perspective of your year four students when they want to search for information about their teacher, or in particular, their parents when they want to find out about you. What is out there that could be misconstrued or indeed is inappropriate and can be directly seen as such. So, and think about what you might be able to do about improving your digital footprint. So share a screenshot or an example of um, some material within reason. Obviously we don't want to see any really inappropriate material if that exists out there about you. But in order to um, promote discussion, either in Teams or in your tutorial about digital footprints, um, share some of the material that exists about you. Then in tutorials, what I'd like you to do is with your peers and your tutor, discuss how you're going to continue to learn about technologies education after this course and throughout your career as a teacher. What are some of the ideas that you've taken from this session and from this course, but also other ideas that you may have um, that will enable you to continue as an effective teacher of technologies education, which of course is what we're focusing on in this course, but more generally as an effective and accomplished teacher. So, to wrap things up, just finishing with a little video clip that I always like to leave my students with. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see the... Okay, I'm not sure what's going on there. Them as the crazy ones. the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Okay. So, as a teacher, particularly as of a technologies teacher, 
You want to have students that go out and change the world, make the world a better place. As a teacher educator, I want the same from you as my teachers, as my students. Now, in this course, we've talked a lot about curriculum frameworks and expectations and rules and processes, but all of these can be ignored as you gain experience as a teacher. Don't ever feel bound completely. Certainly you will have to fit in within expectations, but you always try to exceed those expectations as you develop as a teacher. Um, there will be opportunities for curriculum change. There will be opportunities for the entire curriculum to change in dramatic new ways throughout your career. You want to be in a place where you can contribute to that, not just be subject to it. So think about what you can do as a teacher to really make a difference, not just to your students. They are, of course, your immediate and most important priority, but to education as a whole. I hope to see you in the future at conferences and workshops and other events to do with teaching. And I hope to see that you're one of the leaders and the developers of new ideas and new initiatives, particularly around technologies education. But however you progress in your career, try not just to be ordinary. Try to look at what you can really achieve when you go beyond the expectations that you may have for yourself as a teacher and certainly the expectations that others may have. So in wrapping up the course, I'll just leave you with one final slide to finish things up with.